My name's Austin Serafin. I've been blind since birth. I started programming when I was seven on an Apple IIe. That was the first computer with a screen reader. And that's how a blind person uses a computer. They use a program that reads to them. I got my first PC in 1990 and used MS-DOS all through the 90s. We entered kind of a dark age of accessibility, coincidentally, when Windows became dominant. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And after one particular Windows-related freakout, I couldn't take it anymore, and I switched to Linux. And now I use a Mac. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right on. Um, in June of 2010, I got an iPhone, and that changed my universe as soon as it entered into it. The blind are used to getting nothing from companies, and we felt skeptical when Apple first announced that they would include a screen reader called VoiceOver with their iPhone. And we were like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. How can a blind person even use a touchscreen? And, <laughs> and we all made fun of it. And, so, and then a friend of mine actually got one, and she just started going nuts about it and called me and saying how great it is and how it's the next big thing and all this. And I'm like, really? Like, we were just making fun of this like three days ago. And she's like, I know, I know. You have to check it out. And I was like, all right, fine. So I went to the AT&T store with my mom, and since I'm a nerd, I actually read the manual the night before. So I had a pretty good idea of what to expect, actually. And as a result, I picked it up and was able to use it right away. I checked the weather. I checked stocks. I could read a stock chart for the first time. And that's the feature that really sold me, because that, you know, that I could read a stock chart for the first time really showed Apple's detail and the commitment to accessibility. Uh, so that really sold me. And once I, I bought the phone, I was buying the phone, and Mom asked if I could get a text message on it. And the guy at the AT&T store said he didn't think so. Often the people you know, who work for these for the stores know that the accessibility features exist, but they don't know about the limits and the capabilities. I said, I think it can, based on what I've read and what I've seen so far. And she sent it, and it came right through. It said, hi, Austin, and everyone felt moved, even the guy at the AT&T store. <laughs> <laughs> so I got my brand new awesome iPhone home, and I was so excited because now I could finally run apps. Everyone was talking about running apps. No one said, what apps? They were just talking about apps. And so I was like, cool, I can finally run apps. And so I was thinking about what apps. And I was thinking about different devices that are made for the blind. And this is the thing that you have to understand. This is why the iPhone is so revolutionary for the blind. There are a whole bunch of devices that are made just for the blind that often cost a lot of money and aren't very well supported. They have low demand, et cetera. And so I was thinking about this as I was playing with my iPhone. And I, for instance, there's a device called a color identifier. It costs $200, and you can point it at an object, and it tells you the object's color. So I thought about that, and I typed color identifier into the App Store. An app came right up, color ID. It cost $2. I downloaded it and installed it, and I was like, oh, this is the coolest thing. The iPhone really is the awesomest thing. I ran it. <laughs> I ran it, and it just kept saying black, black, black. And I was like, oh, my heart kind of sunk. I was like, oh, once again, harsh reality has reasserted itself. And, uh, but then I thought about it, and I was like, well, wait a minute. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you already see where this is going. It's pitch, <laughs> it's pitch black out. I have no lights on. And yeah, I forgot, you need light to see color. Right, so I turned on the light, and out came the color. And that's when I knew that the iPhone was just totally awesome for the blind, and it really would be the next big thing. Oh, an interesting thing, by the way, to note about that app is he didn't even make it for the blind. And that's the advantage to building accessibility into something, as Apple did, as a core part of the product instead of just an afterthought. It's also much more helpful to think of accessibility in terms of a spectrum, that is, from no accessibility to total accessibility. So after I got into the iPhone, I wanted to start getting into programming the iPhone. And for that, I use a language called Ruby Motion. It's Ruby for iOS and Mac OS. It's all text-based, so it's totally accessible. And I've been doing some really awesome work in that as well for the accessibility. So you can check that out if you're into that. In January of 2012, I moved into the city, into Philadelphia. Remember, all this started happening in 2010. So in 2012, I moved into the city. And that changed my life forever as well. I lived in Swarthmore for most of my life. And Swarthmore is a beautiful town. Swarthmore is awesome. Swarthmore is very much like the Shire from Middle Earth, <laughs> from Lord of the Rings. You know, it is. It's very much, keep your nose out of trouble, and no trouble will come to you. And <laughs> you know, change comes slowly, if at all. And that's how it is, and that's awesome. 
But just like Frodo, one day I had to leave the Shire, and I moved into the city. My condo, actually, before it was a condo, was an old school building with crack dealers in it, apparently. And, uh, but now it's a beautiful, awesome condo with young professionals. And that's the kind of change that's taking place in the city. In May of that year, of 2012, I began learning a really cool skill called echolocation. And that is basically seeing through sound by making a simple tongue click, like uh, a blind person or anyone can train themselves to actually see through sound. Instead of seeing through reflected light, you're seeing through reflected sound. The brain simply decodes the reflected echoes from that pulse, like sonar. And this works because the brain is neuroplastic. That is, the brain is capable of forming new pathways, in this case, between the visual inputs and the, the auditory inputs, rather, and the visual centers. So that really uh, gave me long-range vision for the first time, and it helped me feel much more plugged in and immersed in the world around me. So once I got my feet on the ground, later on in the year, I decided to get into the Philly tech scene, and actually, in, January of the next year, I have checked out Indy Hall. Everyone told me I had to check out this place called Indy Hall, a co-working space on North 3rd Street. It's now known as Nerd Street, officially, by the way. So, yeah, very cool. So I went to Indy Hall, and that was another total life-changing thing. Indy Hall has a motto, JFDI. Uh, they won't let me say what it stands for up here. Uh, just effing do it is basically what it comes down to. And it's not just the motto of Indy Hall, it's really kind of the spirit, I think, of the whole, you know, renovation that's taking place and revitalization. Uh, I've talked a lot about accessibility in terms of technology, but anything can be made accessible, it can apply to anything. A few months later, when I was at an Indy Hall event, I met a friend named Sonia, and we began a project called Braille Street Art. We do sticker art, and she prints them, I braille them, we collaborate. They've, it's gone over really well, people really are into it. We actually won the Philly Geek Award for uh, Best Visual Artist, I believe it was. I told them I wasn't actually a visual artist, but they gave us the award anyway. So, yeah, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. And you might even see some Braille street art around, who knows. And another really neat thing I started doing last year was touch tours. I met a woman named Trish Monder, who's also here today, and uh, she heads up the touch tours at Penn, at the university, at the museum. And she invited me in. She asked if I'd like to come in to feel 4,000-year-old Egyptian statues. And I said, yeah, of course I'd like to come in and feel 4,000-year-old Egyptian statues. So I came in, and it was awesome. It was like going back in time, being able to actually touch the stone and to be able to read the carved hieroglyphs in the Ramses statue, and it was amazing. We were eating lunch afterwards at a sandwich shop, and she asked if I'd like to become an assistant docent and help guide other blind people on these tours. And I said, yeah, that sounds awesome. I just have a question, though. Uh, what's a docent? <laughs> I, <did. laughs> I had no idea. But uh, I know now, and it's been a wonderful thing, and we've actually gone global in the AP uh, with that. Well, Philadelphia is a great city for accessibility. It's not too big, it's not too small, it's not New York. You know, it's... <laughs> it, yeah, I know. I know. It's just the right size. Um, Transportation, you can get pretty much anywhere in a reasonable amount of time. Transportation can be a little challenging for the blind or the sighted. Um, for walking, one thing I can say for walking, it'd be really neat if we had audible traffic signals. I actually heard one today here uh, close to this building, which was cool. Um, that would be nice. Then for getting around, of course, there are buses and trains. Often, it's uh, good to have door-to-door uh, -door service. Uh, there is one option for the blind called paratransit. We have another name for it. We call it Paris Stranded. <laughs> That's often what ends up happening. There are, of course, cabs, which can have their usual problems. They're, they can be good, but they can have problems, too, like dropping you off and abandoning you across the street after you gave them a good tip, you know. Um, there's Uber. Now, this is kind of funny. Uh, Uber offers door-to-door -door service, and they recently discontinued their SMS text message service, which was the most accessible way of doing it. And their app and their website that they force you to use now haven't been accessible. And it's funny, just before I left, literally, as I was going out the door, I got an email, a mass email from them saying their new mobile website just went live. So I haven't gotten a chance to test it for accessibility. I wonder if they got wind that I was going to bring them up at TEDx. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying, the email came out right before I left. So, <laughs> I don't know. 
There was another transportation option in Philly as well called Sidecar. That was ride sharing, but that was too progressive and evolved, and the PPA took it away. Um, <laughs> And that brings us to the challenges that we have to overcome. I mean, you know, like for the, we have to clean up these regulatory bodies and governments. I mean, for a parking authority to piss off a blind person, I think is pretty low. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we've got to clean these groups up. Socially, I think, you know, we've got to uh, avoid cliques. We have to remain as open and inclusive as possible. And I th that also brings up, by the way, another type of accessibility, which is gender equality, all the wonderful efforts getting more women involved in coding and business and things like that in the city. That's also a form of accessibility. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely right. Absolutely. And of course, like I've been saying, we just need to get these companies to start caring and just start making their stuff accessible. We've got the technology. It's 2014 now. We can start building these awesome interfaces. We just have to start using this technology. I already mentioned transportation. Earlier, I mentioned how easily I could check a stock on my iPhone. We need to get the banks and financial institutions to make the same commitment to accessibility so I can execute a trade with equal ease. Uh, there are grocery services now. Some of them are pretty accessible. Some of them not accessible at all. And there's also a lot of room for accessibility in household appliances, a lot of room for improvement, things like washing machines, dishwashers, stoves, things like that. And companies, a lot of them view accessibility as this kind of added feature, this thing that may be nice to have, maybe they'll get around to thinking about implementing it one day. And I ask them, though, do you, do you produce something that's an extra thing? These things I just mentioned, you know, transportation, banking, um, groceries, doing the laundry. These are not extra nice things to have. These are basic amenities that someone needs to have to live independently and with dignity. And that's why it's so important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the positive thing about this is we have the capability within us now to start making a change. As soon as we leave here today, we can start improving um, things. If you think about the history of Philadelphia, in some ways we were the birthplace of modern computing. Uh, we had ENIAC, which was for a long time the fastest computer. Ben Franklin, the original nerd, now walked down what is Nerd Street, yes. And when uh, William Penn first designed the grid system of the city, he did so to help fight against overcrowding, fire, and disease. So when you think about the history of Philadelphia, we really have accessibility in our DNA. And that's why I feel that Philadelphia could really become known throughout the world for its accessibility. All we have to do is JFDI. Thanks a lot, everyone. Yeah.